to this uh, workshop for the Pinellas County Commission. Uh, we're going to start with our agenda item. And out of respect for the folks that are here, I don't see any of the... Okay. Let's start with the city. No, the sheriff. I'll, that's not even on my... The bloodhounds. The bloodhounds. Blood what hounds. was I thinking? We, we wanted to get everybody in a good mood. So, Sorry, uh, we, sheriff. We, uh, we, we Please, brought the dog to in. the podium. I apologize. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I uh, understand that you know, wanted to hear about the new dogs we have um, with the bloodhounds. So, you know, traditional canines, and we've got about 15 uh, that are traditional canines as long, along with the city police department, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Largo, Pinellas Park, Tarpon, everybody has some uh, number of uh, traditional canines. And the traditional canines are police work dogs that uh, track and also our patrol dogs where they will apprehend. Um, and they're great, they do great work, uh, but their limitation is uh, by the scent. And most of the canines, again, the traditional ones, they ground scent, they air scent, a combination of both. But in a heavily urban area that we're in, is they're limited by contamination. And when you get on pavement, you get a lot of people around, they're ineffective because the scent, either you lose it within an hour um, and you lose it because of contamination. So uh, about a year ago, uh, we started looking at the bloodhounds, and the bloodhounds are different. They're not uh, patrol work dogs, so they don't apprehend, but they do track, and they track extremely well, and they track differently uh, because not only do they air or ground scent, but they also track a person's scent. And they can track somebody for uh, up to 18 hours later and they don't have all the contamination issues. If you remember, you know, sadly, last September, we had Deputy Hartwick, who was killed out on the interstate. And the guy who killed him fled, uh, and he was hiding, hunkered down out there, and the scene was extremely contaminated. And it was about, probably about nine hours later uh, that we found him hunkered down in the bushes, and we had called the Pasco County Sheriff's Office. They came down with their bloodhound. It's because that bloodhound is the one that found the guy who killed Deputy Hartwick. So in our urban environment, and we make these dogs available, and Deputy uh, Shomp and Deputy Ashworth are here. They can come up and talk a little bit about and show you the dogs. Um, but we make the dogs available to all the agencies, uh, St. Petersburg, Gulfport, Clearwater, everybody throughout the county. Uh, it's just adding uh, to the resources we have, and in a great way. And the other, it isn't just apprehending the bad guys. Where these dogs are also, and these uh, bloodhounds are, are very useful, is when you have missing people, missing kids. Because again, you can take an article, you can take a pillowcase, you can take a hat, you can take an article of clothing, and they will track that individual's scent. So um, again, uh, just a new resource, an added resource we have. And I think uh, Chair Long asked us to come in and uh, bring the dogs and show them to you. So I'll stop talking and you can bring the dogs up. And uh, they're not gonna bite you, they're not work dogs. Uh, they're, they might, they're probably gonna lick you, but um, that's about what they do. Uh, but so far, so good, and, and the, the training is also much more extensive. Um, it takes almost a year uh, to get them trained up. So they've only been on the street now for the last few months, still getting their ways. They're not full grown. Uh, when we got them, they were literally puppies. They were only a few pounds. If you look at the compare and contrast photos when, when we got them compared to what they are now, they're really growing. But you can see he's rolling around on the floor over there. So um, why don't you guys, you guys want to come up and uh, any questions that anybody have, or you can ask them directly. Any questions? What's that? He's, he's, no, he, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so anyway, we're, uh, you know, glad to have them. They're doing great work, um, and, you know, it, it really an asset to everybody in Pinellas County, not just the Sheriff's Office, but for all the police agencies as well. And, and they're calling and using them, and uh, they've had some good success so far. Sheriff, are they full grown? No. No, they're not. Um, so I think right now, what are they guys, about 80 pounds? Yeah. Right. What, what are they going to go to? That was 110. Yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully around this foot, probably around the 100. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 um, we have little bugs that they just like we had, like kind of just maybe some food scraps and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's just something else to kind of uh, fill the fill the variety of, you know, the kind of customers that we have. Like, 
<laughs> slobber, slobber. So then anybody want to pet them, you're welcome to, or we can, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, yeah uh, we, how many do you have, Sheriff, of these? Two of these, that, two, yeah. So, 16. Yep. Do they all go home with their owners? They do. Yeah, they live with them. Yeah. They, um, that's the way to do it and because they, they integrate in with the family and they live there. Um, and then when the dogs retire, uh, because the average life of a work dog is probably five years, somewhere in there. And a lot of the deputies that are in the canine unit are on their second dog or even some on their third dog. Some stay in there for a long period of time. And so once the dog uh, reaches its maximum work life is, is that we retire the dog and the handlers keep it. In fact, the state came up with a program the um, last couple of years where they actually will fund some of that. Uh, so the dogs are <laughs> funded, if you will, to the handlers in retirement. So um, they live with them, they become part of their families, and then they keep them once the dogs are, because they have integrated into the family. So they just we just retire it and dog, the handlers keep them. What, what's the, the typical case that they would be, situation that they would be brought out? Well, really anything, but what they're doing is, is, is they, just like any other canine, you know, a call comes in, uh, whether it's a prowler call, a burglar call, you got a robbery suspect, et cetera. You know, but where we're going to use them more, too, is, is in the missing person cases and those where it's long term, the scene's been contaminated, um, and they can get an article and something to get the person sent. So. Um, they're really, I'll call it canine plus. Um, it, all the other, the traditional work dogs are doing the basic work. Um, but we really do have a problem in Pinellas because we're so urban. There's no rural area in Pinellas County. This isn't Pasco or Hernando or even southern eastern Hillsborough County where you, you get out there on the grass and you got an open, open area is that tracking's pretty easy. But you get into the areas you know, where you got a lot of concrete, you got a lot of people, you got an urban area, is it makes it much more difficult. With these guys, though, it, you know, again, you don't have to worry about that if you have an article and, and the time doesn't matter. Um, so, and you have people with dementia, you have missing kids. That's what these guys really are that added resource for. No, it's, that's an amazing added tool that we have now. Did I hear you say that they're in the FRS? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drop. <laughs> how much? Uh, how much more do these costs to raise to tr to be uh, in play versus the shepherd? Say just a comparison. I, mean, I, I would imagine much more. The cost to get them ready for work. It's time. Yeah. Okay. You know, you, you're really talking about. You know, the, the average cost of a canine depends where we get them from and the breeders and whether it's the Malinois or the German Shepherd or these guys. I mean, the average cost of a canine dog is about $10,000 uh, to buy the dog from the breeders. And, um, it, but the cost as far as getting them ready, it's personnel time. It's just time. And it takes, these guys got finished a little early. They did a great job getting through the academy and getting through the, the training program, the canine uh, training program. But they say generally it takes for for these guys uh, about a year. Yeah. You know, it's it's just time, but no additional as far as any additional costs. But it's well worth it. You know. I'm in treats. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because, yeah, 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 yeah. The food now the food costs that's a different story. But you know, we will have to come back for a budget amendment on that one. <laughs> I don't know, tell, tell, tell Commissioner Flowers what they eat, you know, how, what do they go through? Same. Yeah. So it's typically, uh, typically about four cups a day. Uh, that's just where, where we're at right now. Uh, yeah. That kind of maintains like, the weight that they're at. Uh, the food itself is, is a very high protein, uh, four, four active dog ones. And, uh, we're, doing, we're doing tracks every night. We just have to burn the calories and something in. Uh, we just have to try to get them ready for that every day. Health-wise, health-wise, because it gets so hot oh, during the yeah. summer, absolutely. and they absolutely. Uh, so, so just like the, the other dogs, uh, they're very susceptible to, to heat injuries, right? Um, but we were very fortunate uh, to put through a, a medical class uh, for the dogs. Uh, they were
And do you use a specific language? Because some individuals may use German or French or whatever so that others can't attempt to command the dog. Do you yeah, all? So, so that's And, and it can, you know, it can't, and a lot of times too, is they're using those commands too, is that when they are the traditional patrol and apprehending dogs. Um, and since these guys don't apprehend, it's a little bit different. Um, and, and that can cause problems too, because sometimes if something happens to the handler and somebody knows the command and they want to give it, but if it's a unique command only the handler knows or it's in a different language. So there's ups and, si ups, ups and downs with that. Uh, but you know, like you said, it's really a handler preference. Um, Amazing how well trained they are, and I've got a dog that's two years old that needs some training. Is it possible to lend them for a while? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it takes a lot of work. I mean, these guys are dedicated to it. It's something that they commit to. It's a lifestyle because they're with that dog all the time. It becomes part of the family, and it's a real commitment to it. But it's a, it's a lot of work from where they started. And those guys, when they brought them to the office, and, and these came out of, I believe, Tennessee, right? Is that where the – Tennessee? Kentucky, yeah, same difference. Right? No, but, <laughs> Ooh. my um, my yeah, wife will yeah, say. I knew it was up there. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of the, the German shepherds, a lot of those come out of uh, Ocala, some out of Ocala, some out of North Carolina. But anyway, um, when we got them, I mean, they were really. How, how much did they weigh when we got them? Three pounds, four pounds. Yeah, I mean, they were literally these little dogs. They brought them in the office and they were walking them around, and these things were like, you know, this big. It was, it, <laughs> you know, just to see them now. And that was not that long ago. Yeah. So do big. they mind being separated? I understand they're brothers. Uh, yeah, we try to keep them separated. You know, when we get them together, they love to just play and run around. So sometimes it works to keep them separated. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Maybe they're twins because they. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, really. They're beautiful. Yep, so it's um, fun for us to have them around. Everybody loves them and get them out in the community. And most importantly, it's the work they're doing. So you, do the, you do a lot of the training at night then? Is that. Uh, I'll We've got canines on duty 24-7 throughout the county, so. Okay. Do you ever so take I, them into the, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm fine. Go ahead. Do you ever take them into the schools? Shall we get a picture? Yeah, let's get them? pictures. Yep. Commissioners come come up I'm somewhere in here and they'll get pictures oh, no, they, they with the sheriff. Oh. Sure, whatever you say.
Well, I Madam mean, Chair. Yes. Uh, for the incoming chair, um, Commissioner Peters, every meeting. Bring in animals every day. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I would like to ask Mayor Welch to come forward and do your thing. Yes, sir. Nice to have you here today. It is great to be here, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Administrator Burton, Attorney White, and all the members of the great Pinellas team. It's good to see you all again. Uh, bloodhounds. I'm following bloodhounds. Okay. Um, and no, Commissioner Justice, they did not send out the bloodhounds to bring me back. So I saw that coming. It's an honor to be able to give you an update on the historic gas plant uh, development. Uh, in conjunction with our Heinz Rays partners. I'm joined today by our City Development Administrator, James Corbett, our Economic Development Director, Brian Caper, and a familiar face uh, to you all, my Chief of Staff, Doyle Walsh. I'm really excited today because of the significant progress that we've been able to make uh, over the past two years. And we've done that through partnership through our county-city partnership and the public-private partnership, we are close uh, to securing the largest economic development project in Pinellas County's history, creating jobs, housing, and office space, and fueling e economic activity, including tourism, health, innovation, arts, retail, and other sectors, and providing the economic opportunities that were promised to the gas plant community uh, some 40-plus years ago when I was still a student at the Lakewood High School, <laughs> Commissioner Flowers and Justice. So it's been a long time coming, but what I want to convey to you is thanks. Uh, we could not accomplish this without a strong partnership uh, with the county and the TDC, without a development partner with the strength and the community focus of the Heinz Tampa Bay Rays team. And although I know that the commission has not formally approved uh, the bed tax contributions that we are requesting, I do want to thank you, you know, each commissioner, for taking uh, the meetings, for giving us your feedback. I want to thank you, Commissioner Long, uh, as this year's chair, and Commissioner Justice, as last year's chair, and the TDC for the spirit of collaboration and for considering this request that truly will have, we believe, countywide benefits. Um, before I bring Mr. Corbett up for the presentation, I do also want to thank Administrator Burton and, and his team for working very closely uh, with our team and with Heinz Rays from the start of this project. This is a partnership, and this is what progress should look like in our community going forward, and I look forward to the next step. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to bring up James Corbett. Thank you all. James, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Mayor stated, I'm James Corbett, City Development Administrator. I also want to echo uh, Mayor's sentiment about the partnership. It's been great working with Administrator Burden. Um, I think part of the, our ability, or a large part of why we were able to get to where we are today, is the, the uh, partnership and collaboration. So what we'd like to do today is just talk a little bit about the historic gas plant development. So we're going to be talking about the approximately 60 acres of development that this is the uh, part of the development that not does not include the stadium So here you will see a few renderings of the development uh, What it would potentially look like on the top. It would be the top right You'll see the stadium there in the background. I believe the Raysheim's team will talk a little bit more about that when they present so uh, with our uh, Development program what we wanted to do is to ensure that there was going to be a urban dense development um, and, and we believe that um, that this will be uh, kind of filling, we've, we've heard it say, fill the, the uh, hole in the donut in downtown St. Petersburg. I'm going to focus on the target development uh, with the understanding that we do have a minimum development requirement, um, but we're, we feel fully confident that we will reach the target development if not exceed it. So within the target development, there is a plan to have 4,800 market rate residential units as well as 1,200 workforce and affordable units, which will consist of 600 workforce and affordable units on site and 600 workforce and affordable units off site. We also have planned 600 market rate senior units, as well as 750 hotel keys. 
Um, this development has 1.4 million square feet of Class A office, and medical office, which is really exciting because we have not had a purpose-built office building in St. Petersburg since the 90s. So we're really looking forward to introducing uh, some office, new office into our downtown space and to encourage uh, new businesses to develop or to relocate to St. Petersburg. Um, the development will consist of 750,000 square feet of retail space, 100,000 square feet of entertainment space, 50,000 square feet of civic use, and 90,000 square feet of conference ballroom and meeting space, which is also what we believe a really important component to have that conference meeting space, something that we, we lack in the, in the city as well as the county, uh, additional conference and meeting space. And uh, for sustainability and resiliency, we're gonna have 14 acres of open space dedicated. Next, we'll talk about the affordable and workforce house. As I mentioned before, when the uh, RFP was uh, reintroduced under Mayor Welch's leadership, uh, there were 23 guiding principles. And one of the things that was really important that from the onset of the RFP is the importance to have and include workforce and affordable housing on the development site. So as I mentioned pre previously, there will be 1,200 rent restricted units, 600 on site, 600 off site. You'll see the breakdown here on the, um, the income eligibility. So there'll be 500 units at 120% of AMI or below. Uh, and then the remaining uh, 700 units will be at 100% of AMI or below with 300 units specifically being at 60% of AMI or below. This is just an additional breakdown of the on-site units. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is there will be three standalone properties on the gas plant site. These three properties will be leased to the Rays Hines to ensure essentially permanent affor affordability. They will be leased to the Rays Hines for a period of 99 years to ensure that those properties remain affordable in, in perpetuity. Uh, all other workforce and affordable units will have a 30-year affordability period to also ensure long-term affordability. So for the off-site units, Ray's Hines has the opportunity to either develop, acquire, or finance those units. So they could develop units new um, that don't exist. They could acquire market rate units and convert them to workforce and affordable units, again, with that 30-year affordability, or they could finance um, the creation of workforce and affordable units to satisfy the 600 off-site units. And then finally, um, as you all know, currently um, at Tropicana Field, the majority of the 60 acres that we're talking about is a parking lot. So uh, there is going to be a requirement for in infrastructure to create a grid. So we're talking roads, streets, light, street lights, uh, stormwater, wastewater. Um, so uh, the city has committed $130 million towards the infrastructure, which will be built out over four phases. Uh, the city is capped at the $130 million. Uh, Ray's Hines will be responsible for any uh, of the costs that exceeds $130 million. We estimate that the infrastructure will cost somewhere between $180 to $200 million. So essentially, the Ray's Hines team will be responsible for somewhere between uh, somewhere between uh, 50 to $70 million for the infrastructure. So next, I'm going to turn, turn it over to Brian Caper. He's going to talk about some of the job creation and economic benefits and really uh, from my perspective, uh, this is really the, the benefit of this, not only to the city of St. Petersburg, but the county as a whole. Thank you, James. Good morning, commissioners. As James mentioned, I am Brian Caper, the Director of Economic and Workforce Development for the city. I'd like to focus a little bit on some of the economic impacts of this project. Uh, these numbers do include both the stadium and the, the 60 acres of, of development for the historic gas plant district. And these numbers came to us through the Victus report uh, that was done in conjunction with the county, as well as an HRNA study that was commissioned by the city to look at the economic impacts related to specifically the development. In looking at job creation, the stadium construction is estimated to generate 4,500 full-time equivalent jobs and the remainder of the gas plant site is estimated to generate 28,400 full-time equivalent jobs for a total construction amount of 32,900 jobs. Ongoing stadium operations are estimated at 4,000 full-time and part-time employees annually, and this matches what uh, the Rays currently employ at Tropicana Field. 
Looking at the rest of the development, it's estimated to generate approximately 7,000 full-time jobs annually. And it's important to note that these jobs will range everything between the service industry for the entertainment uses that will be brought on site, retail uses that will be brought on site, uh, to medical, a medical office, as well as corporate office. So there will be a wide range of wages, uh, skill sets, education requirements uh, as part of these jobs coming online. The total ongoing job creation is estimated to be 11,000 ongoing full-time and part-time jobs annually. And when combining that with the construction, uh, the project is estimated to generate just shy of 44,000 ongoing full and part-time jobs. Looking at the economic impact and the return on investment, often when uh, public goes in on a, a project, there isn't a return on investment. Usually it's negative or, or we're lucky to break even. In this particular instance, uh, we feel that we will be generating a positive return on, on the investment. Looking at the city's investment in the project from the $130 million that James mentioned for infrastructure, as well as the city's commitment to the, the stadium, we are estimating in, in nominal terms to be investing $417 million in the project. And we estimate a, a return of approximately $680 million. This would be over 30 year time frame. And that, that $680 million, again, in nominal terms, would go towards city services like fire, police, affordable housing. It would go to uh, help the city with debt service on the project. And it would also go for programs, resources for jobs, and economic opportunities. And diving into those numbers a little bit further, on the, the left box, you can see the total investment. So again, the city is estimated to make an investment of 417.5 million. Pinellas County through uh, the stadium, an investment of 287 plus the, the TDC payment of 25 million. And Ray's Hines investment in the project is estimated to be approximately 5.8 billion. Looking at the right side, uh, you can see over the next 30 years, the property tax revenue that is estimated to be generated from this project, which is important to note right now, uh, is not generating any tax revenue for the county or the city, uh, is estimated to be $415 million in property tax for the county, $475 million for the city. You can see a, a lot of other uh, tax revenue being generated for schools, the Southwest Florida Water Management, Juvenile Welfare Board, and Suncoast Transit Authority. And then looking at the direct developer contributions. So there will be a land payment from Ray's Hines to the city for the, the 60 to 65 acres approximately uh, of $105 million. Community benefits of $50 million. And then as James mentioned that any additional expenses related to infrastructure beyond the city's $130 million contribution is the responsibility of Ray's Hines and we estimate that to be approximately $50 million for a total re return on investment over the next 30 years of 1.6 billion. It's also important to note that most of these benefits really will not be generated toward the end of the project. The further we go out, the more uh, this, these tax revenues uh, increase as the, the entire development comes online over the 20 year time frame. Uh, so this is expected to grow exponentially as we look beyond 30 years. So now I'd like to take just a couple moments to talk about the community benefits uh, that will be derived from this project. <clears throat> First looking at, at jobs and workforce development, Brace Hines has agreed to a goal of 30% of the construction work on the site to go towards small businesses, minority owned businesses, and women owned businesses, and they've made a guaranteed minimum of 10%. So based on an approximate $5 billion uh, construction value for just specifically the development, we estimate that as anywhere between $500 million on the 10% side to $1.5 billion on the 30% side going toward our, our local businesses. In addition, there is a commitment for job training and pipeline development to make sure that our businesses, our business community, and our residents are able to take advantage of the opportunities that will be coming online with this project. As James mentioned, uh, there is a commitment of 1,200 newly created affordable and workforce housing units, 600 that would be on-site and 600 that would be off-site. And then there is a $50 million commitment from Ray's Hines as it relates to intentional equity. 
And you can see uh, below is, is sort of a list that was provided to the city in the proposal from Ray's Hines. And this was based on the 23 guiding principles that were contained in the city's RFP. So as part of that $50 million, they have identified $15 million for the development of affordable housing. This would be a payment to the city as market rate units come online. Ray's Hines would make a payment to the city that will total $15 million for the city to invest in the Housing for All plan. $10 million for the Woodson African American Museum of Florida. $750,000 in outreach and community engagement. $13 million in restorative enterprise. This is related to mentorships, business creation, business incubation, getting our business community ready for these minority um, women-owned and small business opportunities. $3.7 million in talent pipeline development, $5.5 million in education programming, and $2 million to support the city's Enoch Davis project. And I'll touch on that just a little bit more uh, as we look at the timeline and what's next. So on October 26th, we had a committee of the whole meeting with our city council to present this information. Uh, we are now in the next step of the process, which is our community benefits uh, program. So the city has an ordinance, a community benefit ordinance, that specifies if a project receives certain public investment, um, and, and in this instance, if it triggers over $30 million, which we know it, it will, based on the city's contribution to the infrastructure of $130 million, it does have to go through our community benefit ordinance. Uh, right now, we are about to. Uh, city Council, later this afternoon, will uh, kind of officially set our Community Benefit Advisory Council. It is a nine-member board. It's consisting of eight members of the public and one City Council member to serve on that board. And we will be holding a community meeting next Wednesday, December 13th, with the public to introduce the, the project to them, as well as start to receive input from the community on those community benefits that they really value. And that goes back to the $50 million intentional equity commitment that was provided to the city from Ray's Hines based on those 23 guiding principles. Now we want to hear from the community, is that the right allocation? What programs are out there that we can potentially partner with? <clears throat> what, uh, what gaps are there in what we are attempting to accomplish that maybe need to be funded through the $50 million? How do we take that $50 million and through strategic partnerships, turn that into $100 million, $200 million, et cetera? We will, um, after that community information session that I mentioned next Wednesday, uh, we will start our Community Benefit Advisory Council meetings in January. And we are estimated or anticipated to have four of those meetings starting on January 9th. It will be every single Tuesday uh, throughout the month. And then on January 30th, we're asking the Advisory Council to make a vote on the community benefit package, and ultimately that will culminate in an agreement that goes to City Council for approval. In Q1 of 2024, we are anticipating to go to the City's Community Planning and Preservation Commission uh, to take the development agreement forward for approval, as well as a rezoning um, that will be switching some of the City's DC2, Downtown Core 2 zoning to DC1. Um, it does not impact the, the county's uh, zoning and future land use as that area is an activity center. Uh, we have also anticipated another committee of the whole meeting with our city council sometime in Q1 to go through all of the various agreements and then finally take that forward to city council for approval sometime in late Q1, early Q2, 2024. Uh, with that, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair Long, I would gladly answer any questions that, that the Commission has, or if you would prefer, um, Ray's are, are happy to do their presentation, and we can take all questions at the end. Let's take questions now on your, this piece, and then we can, yes, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's nice to meet you, sir. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and the information. Um, I'm glad that there was a presentation for both parts, because as you all know, the community um, is under the impression that the county has um, anything to do with the planning part of um, the, the piece that, the, uh, that will be the housing development other than Tropicana Field. So thank you for um, additional information in that area. So I just have a few questions. Um, the first question is, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, I know that the council delayed the vote on the consultant or the utilization of the consultant. Can you tell me where we are with that? And then Barry, maybe how that impacts or does that impact us in any way, shape or form? So uh, thank you, Commissioner Flowers. We had one-on-ones with council based on that delay in the vote 
Last week, the consultant met with each council member, and actually that's coming back for a vote today. Okay. So, commissioners, you have that on your agenda. Um, if the council passes it this afternoon, then it will stay. If not, we'll ask that it be pulled on Tuesday. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Um, the estimated revenue, do you all have numbers for the estimated revenue that could be generated from the in-town redevelopment plan in that surrounding area? Because once that um, in-town redevelopment plan portion is complete, I know we were talking about this at our um, workshop or meeting recently, the dollars that will be coming back to Pinellas County. So, Commissioner, are you referring to the 60 acres um, of development no. at the historic gas plant? Mm -hmm. The in-town CRA that's around the area. Yeah, so the in-town CRA for the county's portion is capped at 108 million. That has not changed as part of this development. That was previously negotiated and that has not changed. And so in 2030, it expires um, and everything has to be paid out by 2032. Um, and so we're working on the mechanisms to comply with what we discussed as part of this. Is it opening that up to where they could draw down, but nothing exceeds the cap that was originally set I think five or six years ago. Okay. Actually, more than that, I think. Thank you. Just wanted clarification on that because there were a couple of questions about just really how much money was going into this project versus what we right. were saying. And what really happens is that now that the CRA expires and that cap's reached, now it's all market rate, you know, for you. The, the, that that uh, CRA goes away. Okay. And um, is there um, any language um, concerning the potential renewal of the additional 30 years of affordability. Um, I, I appreciate the 99 year clause because that's something that we were doing when I was on council to try to assure that those units remain affordable for as long a period of time as we can. But for those units that are the 30 year um, time range, is there any type of clause towards the end where whatever council may be seated at that time could look to extend that 30 year period. I'll ask James to speak on if we've talked about, or Barry, if we've talked about options to renew that. Okay. But my position going in was to ask for the longest term of affordability that we can get on all the parcels going on. Okay. So we've got 99 on some of them and 30 years on the others. Okay. Um, so, Commissioner Flowers, there is no language right now specifically about the renewal, but it is common practice when we, we, we do that regularly when we have a land use restriction for income eligibility, when it gets close to nearing the end, uh, typically the city would negotiate extending that, for example, another 30 years. Maybe there are renovations that were to take place. We would contribute to ensure longer affordability, but right now there is no specific language about what would happen at the end of 30 years, but historically we've always looked to see if we can provide an investment to extend that um, that use restriction for an additional 30 years, for example. Okay, and then my last question, Madam Chair, um, and this is just so maybe you can explain it for the public um, to hear. Um, there were some questions or comments by some community individuals um, who felt that the payment for the land of 105 million was low for that particular area based on the growth and development around it. Can you just share, if you have that information, how you all came up with the $105 million cost out for the land? So let me give you the policy perspective and I'll ask staff to give us the, the numbers. But as you well know, uh, Commissioner, that land used to be a thriving community. And there were promises made going back to the 1979 city council action mm -hmm. that had embedded in that economic inclusion, job opportunities uh, for the community. Later, when the displacement happened, those promises were made again. And so we were looking at, again, in the 23 items in the RFP, a list of deliverables returned to the community. And the land value, of course, if we went highest and best, we could put all high-end condos on it, and that would probably get us the most money back. But those other uh, promises, the jobs, the economic opportunities, rebuilding that business community that was uprooted and in many cases never recovered. All those things are just as important and they're not quantifiable in just that land purchase price. So when I, when I was looking at it, it was, are we honoring those promises? Are we getting folks into jobs, which is the most important thing? Um, 
and we, we reached that balance. And I do believe this was the highest uh, offer for the land of, of the four um, proposals that came in. Um, but it's been a great process. We've talked to the community. Um, over uh, 2,000 folks have come to our community conversations to tell us what they wanted to see uh, in this development. And it was jobs, it was economic opportunity, it was housing, because that still is probably the, the number one priority uh, in our entire community. And so that's how we came to that balance of, of the offer. Okay. And just a final wrap up, um, and you already know we this. got one more oh, I'm sorry. technical response. I'm going to chime in and then I'll, I'll have Brian. So I, I don't have, we actually did an analysis of the, the land value. So there was an appraisal that was done um, back in January. And so when the, when the appraisal took place, as Mayor mentioned, the appraisal was based on the highest and best use. And again, when we say highest and best in appraisal terms, that means which will give you the greatest return, not necessarily. We believe this is the highest and best use. Um, so with that appraisal, it was 200 and. $60 million, the, two, the average of the two appraisals. Um, but again, that does not, that would not take into account the $50 million of community benefit. That doesn't take into account the uh, commitment to the 1,200 workforce and affordable units. Uh, that doesn't take into account the requirement to have a, a minimum of 10, uh, up to 14 acres of open space. So when we did the calculation and we, we backed out, uh, for example, um, they wouldn't assign value to the open space or a, a developer looking to do the highest and best use probably would not put workforce or affordable housing on that site. So when we, when we backed out all those factors, we came to a price, it was a, I believe it was approximately 95 million when you looked at everything. Ironically, the raised proposal, Ray's Hines proposal originally was $97.5 million. And as Bayer mentioned, that, that was $30 million more than the closest proposal from that. The, the next highest proposal was about $60 million. We were able to negotiate the land price from the, the $97 million to 105 where we're at now. So we believe when you would take account for all of the, the benefits that we're gonna receive from the site, and it was never, fr from the onsite, when the RFP was crafted, it was never, let's see how much money we can get for this land. It was very important that we honor the promises of the past, that we included workforce housing, that we included uh, the community benefits. So we believe the, the uh, land value that we landed on is more than fair um, that we negotiated. Thank you. Any, um, Mayor, any cleanup issues, any Brownsville concerns um, in the area? I know a lot of cleanup occurred prior to the actual stadium being built way back yonder, but. Not, not to this point that I'm aware of, um, but that is, uh, something we've talked about from the start with Heinz Rays, uh, the issue of the uh, grave sites as well. We continue right. to look at that, and we want to make sure we handle those. those and thank problems. you for that. Yeah, Absolutely. that's. And just the the final closing point is my family also owned businesses in the area. We had a dry cleaners, um, the Browns dry cleaners, and we had the corner store and the shoe shine place where in the back they did a little gambling. Um, you know, forgive my granddaddy for that, <laughs> but. Um, the sheriff is gone. Uh, yeah, and the dogs. <laughs> um, but, um, and I know that the committee that has been formed, I think, um, is being worked under. The Rays have worked with Gwen Reese, and she's spearheading a committee. Um, but it would be really nice for something. And I'm, I'm, they're probably thinking about this, something to show the dedication and commitment of um, the business acumen that, you know, I, I oftentimes think, where would my family be if we had been able to retain those businesses? You know, as far as, you know, my children and my grandchildren, where would we be financially um, if we had been able to maintain those businesses and perhaps grow those businesses along with your family with the lumber yard and whatnot. So, you know, something to commemorate because I know that's a real sticking point for some people. They want acknowledgement, um, if you will. And I believe you all are thinking about that. But just Absolutely. That's built in, you know, acknowledging the historical gas plant, but also having dollars to help fund a kind of a mentorship program, an incubator program for rebuilding that uh, ecosystem for businesses that existed back then, that is part of it. And a another um, big issue that we're focusing on is that talent pipeline. We want folks to be ready for the jobs that are coming. And so we are working on a workforce initiative, working with folks like uh, St. Pete College, PERC, uh, a number of community partners, Urban League. I want us to move in that direction, and we're already doing it within the city, city through a, an academy of folks that come in, get career training, and then can work for the city. 
We want to do the same thing for this project. There are 30,000 construction jobs coming. Um, I'm concerned that we don't have enough folks ready to fill those jobs. And so we want to make sure everyone that wants a job in, in construction or building trades or any of the number of jobs that are coming have the opportunity to get training and then be ready for the job. Okay, Commissioner Lapvala. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here. I have a couple questions uh, having to do with community benefits. The first one on the jobs and workforce uh, development page, um, the construction work on the site will go to the small business, minority owned business, and woman owned business participation. Um, are those all Pinellas County owned businesses that those jobs will go to? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Ex excellent question. So the, the city has currently an SBE program, small business enterprise program, that does look at the, the broader Tampa Bay region. Um, so that is multiple counties. It does extend beyond just Pinellas County. Um, there, there is a differentiation between the city's SBE program and the uh, commitment that Ray's Hines have made as it relates to small businesses. And that, that tends to do with uh, the SBE program that is operated by the city uh, has an ordinance through our procurement department, and it's very specific as to how that program operates, uh, what qualifies as an SBE, and how that, that information is tracked. Because this component um, is going through the community benefits program, it is not subject to the same ordinance. And so that is one of the elements that we will be negotiating over the next six weeks with our Community Benefit Advisory Council. When we look at that 10% uh, commitment and 30% goal, we will have the opportunity to negotiate very specifics with Ray's Hines as, as it relates to um, where those jobs come from, uh, how those are, are necessarily worked with our, our small businesses, our minority businesses, our women-owned businesses. And to that end, that, that is why even in the presentation and in the term sheet, we don't call it SBE, MBE, WBE, because those are very defined terms through the city's procurement ordinances. Um, th this will be treated differently. And so that, that is something that we really want to hear from the community uh, at our December 13th meeting, and we'll continue to work with our advisory council. So at this time, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that, but as it does relate to the SBE component, it, it is not necessarily specific to Pinellas County. So, but it, it is possible that Pinellas County businesses will get uh, preferential treatment? That would be our... You know, our ask of Ray's Hines. We, we want to make sure that we are creating jobs for our local community, that we are helping our local businesses, uh, especially businesses in, in South St. Petersburg and in our community redevelopment area. Um, as Mayor had mentioned, one of the, the larger concerns is just that availability um, and making sure that our businesses are ready uh, to take advantage of that. This is a 20-year project, and so we understand that a business may not have the capacity and may not be ready to take advantage of some of those contracting opportunities on day one, but let's get them ready to take advantage of those opportunities in year five, year 10, year 15, because we know they will be ongoing. Can I just add on to that, Commissioner Latvala? One of the things that I'm, that I'm focused on is that we eliminate barriers and get businesses up to capacity, really working closer with uh, Dr. Johnson and the model that she uh, executed here in Pinellas County with the small business program. It's getting those businesses up to capacity and whether they have issues with uh, bonding or uh, other issues that are, that are more administrative, making sure they're ready to participate. I'm, I'm concerned that we don't have enough businesses in any of those programs that are ready uh, to, to fill that, that need that we have forthcoming. The other question I have is related to the $10 million uh, in the community benefits for the Woodson uh, African American Museum. Um, currently, the uh, legislature has a task force, well, it was created by the legislature, a task force to look at the uh, African American Museum for Florida, for Florida African American history. And uh, St. Pete is one of the three finalists. Uh, the Orlando's one, and I forget the other city. Um, do y'all believe that this $10 million will help elevate uh, St. Pete to have the uh, Florida uh, African American History Museum housed at the Woodson Museum? And if we uh, have it um, in St. Pete at the Woodson Museum, 
Um, is there any projections of what that will do for tourism and, and whatnot for the city and for this site? Thank you, Commissioner. So Terry Lipsy Scott uh, heads up that museum. She also is an appointee to that state board that is, that is reviewing this issue. Um, I'm sure she's got projections on, on tourism, and I believe she's spoken to the TDC, if not last year, the year before that. And so I think they, they do have numbers on that. We feel we're in the running for that, uh, to, to be headquartered uh, in St. Petersburg. We're working with Senator Roussan to make that happen. Um, so that is a priority for us. But whether that happens or not, telling the story of St. Petersburg and, and, and the historic gas plant and, and African-American history in Florida, we think is very important. Uh, and I know they've got a private fundraising arm as well uh, that's doing very well. So um, the $10 million investment uh, is uh, something that gives them a real boost moving forward. And I think the location closer to downtown St. Pete and all the other great museums that we have, the Dolly and other museums, that is really the right location. And so we're really supportive of that, that location. Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate the, um, the presentation. And it, clearly there's going to be other opportunities to get into some of the, of the muck of the deal, because there's a lot to this. It's very complicated, and uh, for me, it's um, it's one thing to understand. I, I need to understand the dynamics a little bit, so I appreciate your being here. The idea that the stadium itself, just the stadium piece, is being split 50-50 between the developer, excuse me, between the Rays, and between the city and the county, uh, that's kind of a starting point for me, and I don't know if that's good or bad. So um, at one point in my in my my life, I used to think that if we had 50 50 percent ownership, that there was a pretty good commitment. Um, we've heard of development deals like this, but much more probably larger, um, like out in Los Angeles, where the owner built you know paid for the entire stadium but got all the development rights around it. So and I'm sure that the comparison of development rights is significantly different. So. But for me to understand kind of what's happening on that development right side is important. So hopefully over the next month or two, we can at least get a better picture of what that is. You know, for example, an office building. Now you talked about, I think it was a million square feet of office, um, of medical office space. Um, and, you know, if I try to do that over 30 years, there's a, a return on investment, the net present value of that. Um, it's pretty significant, um, and it all, all of that now goes to the owner, the, uh, the development group. Uh, all of those, uh, that particular element goes to it. So if you get, I'm just as an example, you're getting $30, $30 a square foot triple net there. You're, you're, you're talking about monies of 450 to $460 million in present value over 30 years. That's a big deal just for that office space. Now, they're taking the risk. It doesn't belong with government. It belongs with the developer, so that's a different story. But just trying to understand a little bit of what that is all about will be helpful to me. Um, and as we look at that and how it combines with the stadium, um, as things move forward and we're hitting the target versus the minimum, um, what clawback provisions do we have if the developer at some point decides that this is not for me and you know things go south or they decide that you know it's not going to happen? So that's important. I'm assuming that the building, uh, the buildings all become ownership owned by the development company. They'll build them, they'll own them, they'll lease them, they'll manage them. The land around it and under it will still belong to local government entities. Is that? True, or the, is the land underneath it going to become part of their ownership as well? So, in the 60, approximately 60 acres where the development where we were talking about today, that land would would become owned by the developer, with the exception of the right of ways. The land where the stadium and the parking garages exist will remain uh, under the county's ownership. So, back to that point about providing infrastructure, providing land, which you know normally you have to. But pay for that, right? They're, we're, it's part of the deal, part of the overall deal. So they're they're getting they're getting that as well. And so just that to me is is really important to understand. And then the last piece, I guess, I would just say, um, to, speaks to the financing of this. And um, 
I've, you know, I've heard about the bonding, and I've heard about us bonding along with you, and I've, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I understand it, and I'm not sure I want to have one joint bond that commits the, each, each to each other on that, but that's something else I, I'll, I'll need to little, know a little bit more about. We may want to pay off those high interest costs sooner and get out from under those excessive costs. Um, I don't know how we're going to want to do it. Uh, that's still to be determined. But um, so look forward to the, as you guys say, partnership. This is, an, a, this is a big deal. Um, and just want to make sure that the residents of this county are getting um, a fair deal. And that's up to all you guys and up to us to make sure that the Rays are good partners they have been to this date. I love that, and I, I'm hoping for that going forward, but just want to make sure that it's a, a fair deal, and the risk should lay with them, not with us, on the development. So thank you. Appreciate your time. Commissioner Akers, uh, you know I can't talk to you about triple net and some of the other terms you mentioned in, in your real estate mode. Uh, we'd be happy to get with you on those specific uh, questions that you had in any, any format that you like. Uh, from a 50,000-foot level, though, the way that I looked at it is that was land that was purchased from uh, some 800, 900 folks that lived in the community, uh, businesses, homes, faith-based organizations. And the city at that time said they would turn that land into jobs and light industry at the time. Now, in my view, in re return for that land going to the developer, we get back, and it's on one of this, the slides that we have in one of the pre presentations. Uh, sales taxes, property taxes, wages, uh, all come back to us, well over a billion dollars, not to mention the other entities that get uh, ad valorem taxes in the county. But also it generates, and you and I have talked about this before, that the answer to poverty is a job. And it generates not only the jobs, but the training to get folks into jobs and help for our entrepreneurs, many families like Commissioner um, flowers talked about that really never recovered. I, I know businesses that once they were moved out of that nucleus of support never recovered. This has dollars to help them kind of rebuild that ecosystem. So overall, I do see strong ROI, ROI uh, for our community. And you know the value of keeping the rays as an anchor uh, on those 20 acres that then supports the surrounding 60 acres, I think is very important as well. So I think the ROI is there, but to get the specific details you want, we'd be more than happy to get Yeah, I, again, I, 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 all the benefits that you've talked about to the county and to the neighborhood, the community and everything else are critically important. And, but it, you know, it, it, me, it does mean that we have a 10-year partnership with the development community, or 20, or 30, not two. Stadiums built and everybody goes away. And I know that's not the intention. I just want to make sure that the things that we're thinking about they were dreaming about and hoping for, have ways to, um, some checks in there, if you will. Absolutely. And I want to make sure that the, the raise relationship, the raise stay, is long term, not some subject to a, another calling. Uh, I look at this as a marriage. Uh, we're engaged, and this is, is long term. And, and uh, I have faith it's going to work out exactly the way that you laid out. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for new marital stats that are better than 50-50. So, okay. Thank you. Appreciate your thank you, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here being here this morning. And uh, appreciate all the good questions uh, from my uh, fellow uh, commissioners. So on the on the target uh, development uh, side here, and there's a lot of you know, blue sky in, in big numbers that have been talked about here that really depends on that target development really, really happening. So as Commissioner Eggers brought up, I think it's going to be important just to know what those details look like if, if that doesn't happen. Are there clawback back provisions and in, in just what options do we have if this doesn't, doesn't transpire? Because really that whole economic development piece really kind of hinges on that part of it. So uh, a couple questions on that. Um, what is the time frame on the target development, and I'm sure that this, the new stadium is probably going to be the most urgent piece of that, but is there a, a general time frame on that? And then on the convention space, I'm really glad to see that there's some convention space in here because we don't have any in Pinellas County, and I think that's really, really important that we have some. Has any um, tourism development dollar estimates been attached to what that might bring in, and whether it's 90,000 square feet or 50,000 square feet on the uh, in terms on the of middle. visitors to the area from that new space? Right, <laughs> right, yeah. Would just be interesting to know what that might bring in as well. I'm not aware of any projections for new visitors based on that. Uh, 
convention space, I'll ask James to answer the first part of your question okay. on, on time frame. So the, the build out for the entire development is approximately 20 years. We're in the process of crafting the definitive documents and obviously there will be uh, language in those documents to assure that we get what we're looking to get. Uh, not just, you know, we hope you build it and that's it. So obviously there will be uh, language included in those documents to ensure that we at a minimum get the, the minimum development, but we, we fully believe and part of the reason I believe um, the, the mayor's selection to partner with Ray's Hines. Hines is a, uh, an international developer um, that has a, a proven track record. So we have no reason uh, not to believe that we will not, I believe we will at least meet, if not exceed uh, those development goals. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Scott, uh, thank you for that point. I, I would just like to elaborate a little bit further on the, the target development versus the minimums. So we understand that at 20 year time frame, it, it's very long. Dyna market dynamics will change. No one knew uh, five years ago uh, what a pandemic would do to office space, and we still don't exactly know what office space is going to look like in the future. Um, because of that, we want to put in as much flexibility to that target development as possible while still ensuring, uh, we, we really started this process with the community 15 years ago. We've gone through several master planning efforts. We've held numerous community conversations. We've had thousands of, of touch points with the community as to really what, what's important to them. And that's why we have those minimum developments, which is to say we understand over 20 years maybe there won't be that demand for 4,800 housing units. Maybe office will be more important. Um, it, it allows Ray's Hines to shift some of those uses while still ensuring that we do have a, a vibrant mix of different types of uses that are important to the community in that minimum program. Um, also, as James mentioned, regarding uh, kind of phase one and, and the phasing, Phase one is essentially everything east of, of Booker Creek. So right now, the very large surface parking lot. That will include the stadium, but it's very important to the city, and it's important to raise Hines that it includes all of the uses that you, you see on that target development and, and minimum development list in order to make it an attractive, vibrant district. So as part of that first phase, uh, Ray's Hines is anticipating to have housing, to have entertainment uses, to have office uses, medical uses. It really is envisioned as once that opening day, 2028 comes and, and we have that new stadium, um, that there are those supportive uses as well that are coming out of the ground to really make that a vibrant area. Um, so as James mentioned, we're working on the development agreement that will really specify how much of each use will be contained in that first phase, but it is very important to the city as well as to the community to make sure that uh, it isn't just a stadium with surface parking around it on day one, that we, we do have a very vibrant district. Great. Thank you. Anyone else from the commission? Commissioner of Justice, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, most of my Topics have been covered by the others, but the I just a couple of things. Um, the conference space, I assume that is part of a hotel or other facility. It's not standalone conference space we're talking about. My understanding, it's all integrated. I, I, Heinz Rays might have some some uh, layouts that they can show you today, but it is one usable space. All right, I just. Not, I don't think anyone's looking to do a standalone convention center. Is is, is my right. concern. All right, and then. We're talking about the office space in the Class A, um, and this is off topic a little bit, but do we know how the Orange Station uh, development is coming along? We do. It's coming along well after being stalled for, for quite some time. Uh, I don't know if you've been by the site lately, but they're actually moving dirt in. We expect the parking garage to be uh, completed early this year with the, other, uh, the workforce and the office building coming online later this year. And do they have a current status or projection of, of what their fill rate, their occupancy rate will be? Not that I'm not aware of, but they are, um, I mean, Pinellas County, St. Petersburg is unique in the, the sense that um, there is a demand. As I mentioned earlier, we haven't had a purpose-built office building since 1992, I believe. So there is a demand, and I, I believe that there, I and the Orange Station develop, uh, developers are optimistic about uh, getting that space leased up pretty quickly. Right. No, that's Orange Station is the former police station, so this would be First Avenue North uh, and Thirteenth Street. Right. No, it's yeah that that desire for the Class A space, and I know they've they've changed from where it started to where it is now. They've changed the the design considerably, but that Class A space was why the county um, 
partnered with you all on that one. And and that re and just to, as a reminder to attract that class office, that's the reason for the subsidy. And, and also, I would like to note that in that change, we increase the minimum office space. So actually, we have more Class A office space under the uh, new agreement that we uh, entered into versus the previous agreement. So we're actually increasing the Class A office space on that development. Excuse me, Commissioner Eggers. Mayor, just so, you know, again, I'm, I, you, I, I'm glad you asked the question about triple net because I don't want to be confusing. When I say that, and it generates, say, $20, $30 million of, of rent, that's, that goes straight to the owner and the debt that they have. The rest, when I say triple net, there's expenses on top of that, property taxes, insurance, all of that, that the, the tenant still has to pay, but they usually net out. Okay. So it's just that triple net number that generates a certain dollar amount. That's the, the return to the owner for his own purposes and or his debt on the project. So anyway. No, no, you continue no. to educate me on real estate. No, I don't. I I'm, thank you. Anyone else? Anybody? Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Barry, did you want to... Have, do you no, have something the, to the say? Raise, I was going to no, bring the raise up. Yep, that's that's why I was going to get up and talk to them for a second. So. Oh, okay. Well, feel free. But in the meantime, <laughs> Brian, do you want to come up with your team, please? Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you here today. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, glad we got the city in between us and the dogs. Um, not that. Not that the city isn't absolutely adorable also. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Brian Ald. I am one of the two team presidents of the Tampa Bay Rays. I'm joined up here today by Matt Silverman, our other team president, Andrew Frazier, uh, our consultant with Best Source, and Lane Gardner from the Heinz Company. Uh, I want to sincerely thank all of you for the time and attention that you've given this matter. Um, to Barry Burton and his team for uh, the negotiation and to all of you commissioners in particular for the public service that you continually provide. Um, we are sincerely grateful. I also want to let you know that while we are here arm in arm with the city and the county, uh, we participated in a highly competitive RFP process, one in which we absolutely put our best foot forward because we feared that not winning that RFP could result in our organization no longer being in our hometown where we very much want to remain. And then after we won that competitive RFP process, every change that was made to our RFP proposal moved in the direction of either the city or the county. So again, while we're here and we've always had cordial, polite discussions, something that I think speaks to the way our city and county and organization work together as partners, it was intense in the room. Um, I think uh, uh, Administrator Burton could, could verify that for you if you want to, as would uh, the mayor and his staff. Um, that said, that's why we are here today and why we are so thrilled to be here. I have three things I really want to focus your attention upon. Number one, this deal keeps the Rays in Pinellas County. And Commissioner Eggers, we intend for that to be forever. The agreement will require us to be here for at least 30 years. but. We believe in this area, this region, the city of St. Petersburg and Pinellas County, and we are putting our foot down for the very long haul. Many of you have heard me say before, we are just now seeing children born to kids who grew up as Rays fans. We believe in the future of this fan base. We believe in the economic growth of the area. This is where we wanna be, and for very obvious reasons, anyone who lives in Pinellas County can imagine why you wouldn't wanna be anywhere else. Number two, we are building a world-class destination one that will attract people and be activated 365 days a year with conventions, with concerts, with festivals, and with uh, events like the WWE and Enchant that we, are getting, that we are either in the middle of or preparing to host right now. I wanna thank in particular our partners at Visit St. Pete Clearwater for helping us attract those events, for supporting us along the way, and for making sure that they remain core to what we do, including making sure everyone is aware that we play in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County. And then finally, we just wanna be a part of making Pinellas County an even better place to live, work, and play. We have been here for a long time, Matt and I for over 20, almost 20 years now, or maybe it is 20 years, right around 20 years. This is where we're raising our families. This is where we participate in schools. This is, a, this is our community. We want to stay here. We are thrilled to be here, and we want to make it a place that we can be more, even more proud of. Finally, before I turn it over to Lane, I, I just want to remind everyone, we would not be here without 
Pinellas County, and the Board of County Commissioners. The original Tropicana Field was built because of the county, and we are here to stay because of this commission that I'm speaking to right now. We are sincerely grateful to you as partners. We look forward to a very long and fruitful relationship together. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Long. My name is Lane Gardner, and I'm with Heinz. I'm the city leader for Heinz and St. Pete and the Tampa area. Um, I'm proud to be here, and I also want to thank the mayor and Brian and James for the collaborative negotiations we've had on the development area uh, around the stadium. So thrilled to be here to present who is Heinz and what do we do. Um, I've been with Heinz 25 years. My last 21 years, I've, I've been in Florida, operating solely in Florida. I'm a Florida native, and I'm proud of that, and uh, thrilled to be here. We've been partnered with the Rays for over 15 years, and our firm submitted on the first RFP over 12 years ago uh, when, the, when the stadium was going to be moved down to the water. So we've been very interested in St. Pete and this project, and particularly in being the partner of the Rays for a, a long, long time. And we're, we're thrilled that we're here today to move this forward. Um, Heinz is one of the largest privately held, family-owned real estate companies in the world. Uh, we've been in business about 66 years. Uh, we've been in business in Florida for 38 years. And in the Tampa St. Pete area, we've been active for well over 10 years with development projects, with multiple development projects going on now in the MSA. Uh, Heinz is represented in about 30 countries. We're in over 200 cities. Uh, we've got almost 5,000 employees worldwide. So we're a large family business. Uh, Jeff Hines and Laura Hines, his daughter, are co-CEOs. And we were thrilled to have Jeff come join us for the large announcement uh, back in September. Uh, this project is extremely important to us and to Heinz. We are very well known for, for executing large, complex projects like this one. We've developed over 13 projects with a value over a billion dollars uh, in, in our history as a firm. I will say that the key to all of this, in our mind, is to have the raise as the anchor tenant with the ballpark in the middle of the development. That is so critical to this entire deal. And if the ballpark were not part of this and we're not going forward, Heinz really would not be involved and interested in developing the surrounding property. It's a critical factor for the whole, the whole project in our minds. Um, I will say that we also are a diverse uh, developer. We develop all product types all over the world. Uh, we're well known for, uh, or most people originally knew us for doing our office development, high quality. And we've got some office stats uh, for you that we can share um, as needed. But we do all product types, residential, office, hospitality. Uh, we're now into industrial as well as we've done some world-class civic facilities such as uh, the New World Symphony in Miami Beach, the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center in Orlando. We also do some sports stadium development at Petco Park in San Diego, and we've been involved with the Minnesota, uh, University of Minnesota on some of their facilities. Um, our focus now in the Southeast really is on placemaking. And so now that we do all these different product types, we are focused on how do you integrate all the uses together in one cohesive community. And placemaking really is not about just building the buildings, but it's about creating the storefronts all have to work together to make all of this work. Um, we do believe that the historic gas plant district will benefit from Heinz national and worldly experience. We, we get the benefit of a best practices group that sits in our central office that shares all of the lessons from around the world that we've learned on how to make these great places for people. And our goal really is to have a place where people want to come back to and it's memorable um, so that they will come back. Heinz is also a leader in environmental stewardship and innovation, and we focus on resiliency as well. Um, we, we have led this industry for many, many years. Our firm has helped write the standards for the lead uh, objectives, as well as we've won the Energy Star certification many, many years uh, in a row. It's important to us. It's a primary focus for us. We have a, our own uh, ESG platform in-house, and we are leading in this industry um, leading other people. We have a carbon neutral pledge by 2040, which is unusual for a real estate company, but we're proud of that. Um, and then I'll point out some of the pictures on the right are uh, what we call our T3 mass timber office building. Um, 
It's T3 stands for timber transit and trade. And so this is a concept that we're doing nationally. We're intending it to bring this to St. Pete as well. Um, the mass timber construction, it gets you a more renewable resource and it also helps on the carbon footprint in front. Um, from an office world, I've developed two office buildings in the last five years in the state of Florida. Um, they were gold, uh, lead gold and lead platinum delivered. And then the T3, we have just launched uh, our latest T3 in Fort Lauderdale in a, mixed use, a smaller mixed use project there. So that will start construction here um, this week actually. And we've delivered this product in Denver, Atlanta, and in the Midwest as well. But just thrilled to be here. Um, we're a leader in this space and really look forward to bringing these principles to the historic gas plant district. With that, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, Chairperson Welcome. Wong. How are you doing today? And good morning, Pinellas County Commission. I'll thank you for allowing us the time to present to you this morning. My name is Andrew Frazier, President and CEO of Best Source Consulting. Um, the gas plant development is a destination that will be a welcoming place where the residents of Pinellas County, St. Pete, and frankly, anyone from across the globe can work, live, and play. We have a vision of a 20-minute neighborhood that will not only be home to Tim Bay Rays, but also world-class entertainment, cultural, hospitality, and art venues, a walkable space that embraces multimodal, safe transportation, and has accessibility for all. While building a world-class destination, the Hines and Rays team will also be building up our community with a $50 million intentional equity commitment. This investment will be focused uh, on affordable housing, capacity building for our workforce, and a strategic investment that will help create pipelines for skilled labor, technical expertise, and future business owners of tomorrow. We also uh, will be placing a strategic emphasis on local supplier diversity spend and for a small minority owned businesses here directly in Pinellas County. Morning, Matt. Morning. Thank you for having us here this morning. Uh, I get to close out and talk about the baseball stadium. Uh, because at the end of the day, we are a baseball team trying to build a, a, a world-class stadium um, that will be the first new sports facility built in this area in decades. Uh, it is designed to be intimate, comfortable, and inviting, but more than that, an exciting place to watch a baseball game and to watch so many other events that this building can host. Uh, it's not just about baseball. Certainly, that's going to be 81 times a year, plus we hope more than two playoff games uh, in most seasons. Uh, but it's also there to attract a wide variety of events. Some are community focused, like high school and college graduations. Others, like Brian mentioned, are in chant, uh, concerts, WWE, uh, but all designed to bring more activity and more visitors to our area, to our county, and, and to the city of St. Petersburg. The estimated cost of the building uh, as of last estimation was $1.3 billion. Since we did that, interest rates and construction costs have not gone in our favor, so we expect it'll be more than that. And when all is said and done, the raised contribution to the stadium will be well in excess of 50% of, of the cost. As you know, the raise are responsible for all uh, additional costs above the public contribution. Um, 30,000 seat is the capacity we expect for fixed seats and it can swell to 35,000, uh, including standing room, and that could be the capacity or a little bit larger for some of the other large events that, that we have. And when we think about the, the ballpark, we wouldn't be doing this without the development opportunity. And as Lane said, the development opportunity hinges upon the ballpark. There is a, a very tight symbiotic relationship between the two. Right now, Tropicana Field sits within a sea of, of parking lots, and it doesn't provide the type of experience that fans have grown accustomed to, that they, that they yearn for. And so what we're so excited about, in addition to this new ballpark, is having it placed in this wonderful neighborhood, uh, something that Heinz has the capacity to actually deliver, and for the ballpark to bring activity to that neighborhood and for the neighborhood to feed activity into the ballpark so that we we all sort of back up the bet and we get a better return on our collective investment uh, in this facility uh, and in the, uh, the development itself. We, we, couldn't be, we couldn't be more excited about this. There's a little bit of 
We're a little scared too. This is a massive project that we're talking about uh, undertaking, but it's been 20 years in the works for us to try to, to make our permanent home here in Tampa Bay and specifically in Pinellas County and St. Petersburg, uh, and the time is now. Uh, we appreciate all the cooperation, uh, and we look forward to answering uh, any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Questions from the board? Anyone? I have a question. Commissioner Latvala. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is for um, either Brian or Matt. Um, values of major league sports teams have gone up exponentially. Um, and this project will increase the value of the team. Um, and I am all for capitalism, but are either of you aware of plans uh, by the majority owner to sell uh, a majority stake of the team after this plan gets approved? Uh, not aware of, of any plans. We have begun conversations with uh, potential investors to come on as capital partners. Uh, this this uh, is going to require in excess of $700 million of capital from the RAISE organization. Some of that uh, can be done through borrowing, but some of that will need to be through equity. And so there are conversations about bringing on new investors to, to bolster the investor group that, that we have. Uh, you know, Stu's intention is for this franchise to be here forever. Uh, we're signing up for the 30 years, but the, the hope and the goal is that this is not a conversation 10, 20, 30 years from now that we are here to stay and here forever. Uh, he's not going to own the team forever. We, we know that. Um, but he wouldn't be undertaking this without uh, the expectation that he's going to continue to be the owner for a while. Anyone else? Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure who could answer this question, but I know there was a lot of concern or talk about the actual parking for Tropicana Field whether or not it would be ground level or if it would be garage parking <clears throat> and how that would look based on the new configuration of the um, of Tropicana Field. Um, and the, the, so if you could share that um, or provide us with that response. And then the other question that I was asked was, would the parking revenue be shared revenue between the Rays and the city of St. Petersburg? So, for example, if parking was $10, $5 will come to the raise and $5 goes to the city of St. Petersburg. I'm going to give you as much specifics as I can. Um, first, we have 6,000 parking spots at Tropicana Field right now. By the time all is said and done, there will be 14,000 parking spots online throughout the development. Um, second, the best way to park at large-scale events is not actually all as close as possible to the front door, which is what we have right now. It takes forever to get in and out, and cars are all crisscrossing around each other at the destination. So we want folks to park about a five to seven minute walk away. Uh, we want to direct people coming from the north to park on the north end, from the south to park on the south end, so you avoid congestion around the middle, uh, and then walk in. Um, most of those spots will be in garages. Most of them will serve the, the ballpark and the other uses. And what's nice is most of our baseball games happen in the evening when parking lots would otherwise not be utilized. I believe we control the revenue on the parking um, for the most part as part of the arrangement that we've struck. Um, but uh, I also just want to make as clear as possible we are the most motivated tenant um, in downtown St. Petersburg to make sure that we get this correct. We're going to need people to come into the games. We're going to need it to be efficient. Uh, and so we're going to work really, really hard to make sure that it works as well as it possibly can. And we will have discussions with every possible techno technology company in the world to figure out the best way to do that moving forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Just one. Just, you have yeah. a question? Yeah. If you don't mind, just just a couple. Um, thank you guys for being here, um, and to the development team and the the group. Appreciate that uh, that background. And certainly, as we talked, th this is a complicated deal, and all the things that are coming with it really make this attractive. It's a destination place. It's it's how do you uh, bring it all together? So I'm excited about about what I'm hearing, and uh, just keep up the great work. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, I hope to learn a little bit more about some of the, d the development opportunities that are there so that we can make sure that our residents are getting a good, fair deal. Um, just your thoughts. Um, there's circulating questions about, uh, well, the name of the stadium and the name of the team and 
um, just, you know, different things like that that are circulating. Yeah, is it going to be the Pinellas County raise or is it going to be, you know, thank you, thank you, uh, Commissioner Latvala for that one. <laughs> Um, I just had a couple conversations with Commissioner Justice. I'm sorry he's not in the room because he's got a handful of ideas that uh, maybe we'll share offline. The name of the team is the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, it, that, that it's going to remain the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, and for the same reason that the St. Petersburg Times changed its name to the Tampa Bay Times, we recognize we've got to draw fans from all across the region. The Lightning and the Buccaneers recognize this too. Um, it's, it's absolutely vital to what we do, uh, and we want to make sure that this entire project screams inclusive welcomeness to everyone, and Tampa Bay is the best way for us to do that. All of that said, the, the mayor's administration has pushed us hard, and as has visit St. Pete Clearwater and the county, to make sure moving forward that we do a better job, and we will work as hard as we can on this, to avoid anyone calling it Tampa, to saying that we're in Tampa, and I think there are a number of creative ways that we can get to that. We um, have committed to at least one game in a St. Pete uniform. We would like for that to be more. Due to complications with Major League Baseball's arrangements with, with people like Nike, we cannot get that commitment set in stone right now. And one of the things that you've noted throughout the development presentation is we have our commitments and we have our goals. Everyone up here expects to hit our goals, but we will not commit to something if we are not certain we can deliver it. Given the history of that site, given our relationship with the county and the city, we just think that's so important. We will deliver on the commitments. We absolutely expect to hit the goals. So that, that's one very obvious way that we can do it, is having a uniform that demonstrates that we're in St. Petersburg. Um, we look forward to a really robust partnership with Visit St. Pete Clearwater, and we want to do everything we can to make sure that partnership helps push out that message that we are in Pinellas County, that we are in St. Petersburg, and that it's a great place to be. But this whole project depends on visitors from throughout the region, uh, and the team name being what it has been for 25 years now, with the exception of having removed the devil back in 2008, um, is going to remain the same. I appreciate your comments, um, and um, I do. I do think that um, the 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 regional component is is critically important. No question. Uh, I was asked. I was asked what my thoughts were about the different name, and I said it was intriguing only because there's so many teams across sports venues, ac across this country that are city centered, and uh, this is a unique area. Um, I think you guys have recognized the growth of St. Petersburg and how incredible that city is on its own, but also how, how this region is growing. So, Yeah, and I want to be clear. We, we understand the discussion. Um, we, we aren't engaging in it because we aren't planning on changing the name, but we understand the discussion. We understand how important it is to uh, get the full benefit of having a professional sports team in your area. Um, but whether it's the Dallas Cowboys or the Golden State Warriors, the New York Giants and Jets, these things happen for a variety of reasons all over the place. We are, we are absolutely committed to keeping the name Tampa Bay while we're here for some of the reasons you just said. Okay, well, appreciate your uh, being here today. Thank you. Look forward to having continued conversation. Is that it? Anybody else have questions? No? I have a couple. Could you speak to the position of Major League Baseball as it relates to the partnership that we are creating here? You had the, the pleasure of meeting uh, Commissioner Manfred a couple months ago when he came uh, to visit right before the press conference. Uh, Ma Major League Baseball is supportive, and they are supportive of this because um, because of the cooperation that they have seen from the city and, and the county, and because of the recent growth that we've seen in our attendance, the momentum that is building, and the expectation that it is only gonna get better from here. You know, there's been somewhat of a cloud hanging over the organization for a number of years as we've tried to figure out where this stadium is gonna be, and I think it has kept some fans from fully engaging, it's kept some businesses from fully engaging with a team that they didn't know was necessarily going to be here for, for several generations. And that started that cloud started to dissipate this year um, as these plans took shape. And I think um, when this agreement is finalized and, and, and ratified and we go forward, we're going to see even more of that. And the, 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 the fan base is there, but them showing up at our games more consistently will happen. And that's what baseball wants. Baseball wants a franchise to be successful, and they want, they want the the, the – the, they want the stands filled with fans, especially when the team wins. And we have won 
way more than we expected to. Uh, we have the third most wins in baseball since 2008, and our attendance hasn't performed like it does in other places. But they now believe with this plan and with this development around the ballpark that that we can lift our standing within Major League Baseball and that this can be a very successful project for us. Thank you. And I would like to share with you that about two months ago, I had the very distinct pleasure of representing the county commission at the World Travel Market in London. And right next to our exhibit was Dubai. Imagine my surprise when I was ever so interested in, in um, having a few bites of their dates that they grow in that country. They were interested in talking about the rays, and I just found that extraordinary. So it's not just the region that you're having an impact on. I would suggest that the entire world is watching you. So good for you. Thank you. I'm very proud to be able to have you here. All of our fans in Dubai as well. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> proud to have you. <clears throat> you here in our county today and doing the good work that you're doing. And it, it, it goes without saying, and I know I shouldn't have to talk about it, but I never hear you all talk about it, but your contributions to our youth and our children in this community do not go unnoticed. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit, since I know the Rays have such a great philanthropic attitude as well. I just appreciate you saying as much. Um, anyone who wants to know about our community work, I encourage you to just talk to anyone you know associated with a, a nonprofit organization in our region. We partner with just about everybody. Um, we seek to get people out to our games to make sure that it's affordable. That's uh, a commitment that the city has demanded of us in the, in the future moving forward as well. Um, and because of, uh, in my opinion, the, the, the reason we're here, the city, the county, the relationships that we have, we are, we are a, an economic powerhouse, and that's why we are committing to another 30 years where we are, but we are also a, a real communal place, and we know each other, and we see each other around, and we're able to make these personal connections, and that's how our community works as well. Um, way back in 2005, when Stuart uh, bought, the, bought the then Devil Rays, one of the first policies we put in place was that every employee got one paid day off per month to volunteer wherever they choose in the community. Any organization whatsoever, it didn't have to be approved, and that was because we wanted employees who wanted to be connected. And through that policy, we have made these personal connections with so many nonprofits. I don't want to run into all of them because it'll feel like I'm playing favorites, uh, but one of the things that really makes running a baseball team worthwhile to all of us is that we believe we can do a lot of good with it. And our community work is one example, but this project that we're talking about right here and, and all that it entails, we think can be uh, an absolute game changer and help us take it to the next level. Um, I believe some of the support we have in this room, some of the support we're getting from the city, and some of the support we're getting from throughout the county is because people have gotten to know us, know what we're about, and they believe that we really are trying to, again, make Pinellas County a, a better place for all of us to live, work, and play. So thank you for that very challenging question, Commissioner Long. Great answer, by the way. And I love what you do for our young people. They are, after all, the future of baseball and the success of our region. So anything else for the good of the order? Anything? Anything from over here? No? So. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. And Commissioner, get the sir, sale. we're continuing to work on agreements. So as they, I think we have a meeting coming up on the 18th as our next meeting where right now it's really been in the lawyer hands to work out some of the structural issues. So you'll see those coming up here, you know, early spring. As, as some of these documents, and I'll keep you informed as we continue to work to be able to bring documents for you where you can see the detail, you know, and have those discussions, so. Perfect. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Goodbye, goodbye, Thank Mayor. You. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thank, Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> okay. So mm -hmm. now are we ready to do our agenda, agenda. briefing? I am. Okay. okay. Um, if you'll go over to the agenda um, under awards and presentations. So this is uh, pretty exciting because you have all heard and seen um, the tremendous work that occurred down on the beaches to restore our dunes. And so we're bringing in uh, gator dredging 
and the owner will be here along with his project team, our Aptum team, who is all the, our design professionals, but also our county employees. Because we turned, we turned contracts around and things, the county attorney's office working with purchasing, I mean, they were making these things happen, you know, overnight. And so we just want to recognize their tremendous effort that allowed us to restore um, a level of protection, um, you know, um, very, very quickly. And so we just want to do that recognition and, and, and really recognize the team for their work. Okay. Um, uh, Community Waterwise um, Awards Program, partner presentation, uh, PSTA. Um, going on down besides the reports, the first item is item 15. It's an award of bid to Snyder Electric. This is an elevator maintenance contract, three years. You can see, as we're seeing with any contracts renewal, 30%, 34% increase uh, in the contract. Um, Report and file, item 17 is an award of bid to Air Mechanical for the Star Center Chiller Replacement, $977,000. Item number 18, this is package number one of our 2024 pavement management and our preservation package. Um, you can see the program that is listed down. So you have um, Brian Derry Road, but then you have groupings of, of streets. That's how they bid those uh, for efficiency. Um, I think uh, you can see the yeah, this one's 8.2 under the engineer's estimate. I'm not sure if the engineer just increased their amount to get, but we're, I think we're starting to see some prices kind of level off. You know, we've seen just hyperinflation over and over. Uh, th you know, and I, I would put, look back to Kelly and stuff, but I think what we're seeing is kind of a leveling off of uh, what we've seen increases over the last couple years. Item 20 is a MSTU for the Palm Harbor Area Senior Council, and this is for Sunroom and Recreation Complex Restrooms, $18,800. Uh, 21 is an MSTU. This is for um, Palm Harbor uh, Parks. And this is for ADA accessibility you know, at the Putnam Park um, restrooms. Yes, Madam Chair, let me ask him one quick yeah. question. Um, on that, uh, back on that number 18, the, the pavement preservation program. Yes. Uh, does Kelly have a, a, a map that we can kind of not see today, but just kind of put together where, where they're planning to do their majority of their work? So Kelly, the question is, do you have a map that we can include in the packet so we know what, you know, this first phase is? Okay. So, Thank so, you. so yeah. email that out to the commissioners and then we can also, well, I guess we can't upload it, but okay. She'll attach it and that way anybody can see it. Perfect, thank you. Um, and remember, this is the first package. How many phases? You have, you have this, this, this is gonna be the first package you're seeing. You're gonna see um, a couple of different uh, phases to this. In the next, in this, package in, in this calendar, fiscal year. In, in this, this fiscal year. Correct, so we have, um, we have our, our annual pavement preservation contract that's in place, and that work is going on right now. What we did, um, uh, especially with the local road program, is kind of bundle some of these so that they're more timely. And uh, so it was a different, we're going to see how this performs versus our typical annual contract. So you're going to see two more packages just like this. Uh, one is actually in Legistar now, and then there'll be a third one. Um, so we're completing all of the work. I think it's scheduled for this fiscal year is about 215 um, lane miles. And... Uh, that's what's scheduled to be completed at the end of the year. So we're gonna do that through a combination of our annual and then three very specific targeted contracts. And I think that's important to maybe, you know, like to pull that out just for conversation, just so our residents understand the complexity, the, you know, that, that we're doing under these different mechanisms, if you will. And, uh, and, and it, it kind of also gets them a feeling of where the work is being done and what to expect and are they coming to my area or, you know, that kind of thing. So that would be helpful. So, we do have, uh, just for members of the public, um, we do have a resurfacing website, and that does have a, a map, a GIS map that shows all of the community roads that are expected to be resurfaced in the fiscal year. And we also have a schedule that is updated every week of the roads being resurfaced this week, and then a look ahead for two weeks. Thank you. But, and Commissioner, just that increment that you're providing for them to be able to complete these, I mean, is... Huge. We, these wouldn't be completed just using penny dollars. We wouldn't have the money available. Um, so happy to see these projects get going. And what and these resurfacings keeps us from having to rebuild roads. 
you know, at eight times the cost. Um, item 22 is interlocal agreement, City of St. Petersburg. This is the inner circle sports contract. Again, this will, if uh, City Council does not pass that this afternoon, we'll ask that this item be pulled. Item 23 is a resolution approving an affordable housing project, um, or I'm sorry, a affordable housing advisory committee report. Um, this is through the State Housing um, Initiatives Partnership Program, and this is the annual report. Item 24 is an amendment uh, to reserves for future years tourists. I'll ask Chris to come up and just kind of quickly break this down for you. There are several different component pieces to this. Yeah, we, we, I, was, I was very happy Kelly worked with the state and they're giving us 50% on our, on our money uh, for the beach nourishment, but Chris tied all together. So, so I'm looking at some of these things in here, and after we deduct this, these dollars from the tourist development funds, can you give us a kind of bottom line of where we are with what we have left there? It's Just for in. kicks and giggles. Yes, I mean, I know that there was plenty of dollars there, but sure. it'd be just nice to keep a running total. So what you have in front of you, the $37 million is what we expect as the total, total, total on the Adalia emergency project. We budgeted 21 million right at the last minute uh, at the second budget hearing. That was what we were looking at at the time. This is now the total that we're looking at for Gator, Aptum, and So, uh, but that is the total, Gator, Aptum, and I'm forgetting the other contractor. Um, no, staff time, staff time is what I'm forgetting. So that's the budget amendment that's before you. We have funds that we already had set aside from tourist development taxes. We're just moving it into this project. <coughs> the total, so that if I'm correct, I just want to get there to answer your questions. $37 million, we're going to get 15 million of that back. <clears throat> so we're going to net out at 22 million. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's the number I was looking for. Yeah. Thank so you. So they came along at sort of different times. That's where they're in two different items. We applied for 30 million dollars at the time with the state, so they funded half of it. That's the 15. So. The. So the question was, will it go back to the general fund or tourist development taxes? The answer is tourist development taxes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and they're they're almost wrapped up on that, Kelly. Correct. Um, you're wrapping up the last section right now. Um, you're off of Madeira Beach. Yes, we're finishing up Madeira Beach, and we are finalizing. Uh, change order number six, which will be Indian Shores. Indian Shores will actually be our largest segment. Mm -hmm. um, so that one's going to take a bit of time. Um, and because of the uh, grant funding that we received from the Department of Environmental Protection, a portion of that funding is actually federal dollars. So we've had to go back and incorporate in the federal requirements um, retroactively into that segment. So that change order is taking a little longer than I wanted it to, but we have to get that part right so that we can ensure we're reimbursed. And the, the final comment on this is there, there are gaps. There's areas that we do not have dunes um, because we do not have easements. And so the, the communities that couldn't provide easements, makes no sense to you know, do a section here and a section there. It just goes around it. And um, so. Which, which communities are those? Reddington's. Uh, yeah. We're not doing any work in Reddington Shores, Reddington Beach, or North Reddington Beach. No, um, no work in those areas, no. Um, Reddington Beach is actually not part of the federal project, um, our normal project. They don't, uh, they've never participated. Um, we did, I did go and speak at their city council meeting, uh, did speak with residents, uh, answered questions, produced an FAQ for them produce re, um, uh, easement documents, but they just, they chose not to. And the, we're working with the cities. So the cities have tried, you know, um, they. The cities have, I just, you know, huge kudos to them. Um, it was a heavy, heavy lift to get all these easements. It was hundreds, 
hundreds of easements that had to be acquired very quickly. So, more to come, but I you know, just wanted to give you a quick update. Thank you for all your hard work, Kelly. It's very much appreciated. Uh, Commissioner Latvell. Have we, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, have we gotten more easements since the hurricane and since this has started? Not for the federal project, no. These are just, these are temporary construction easements that we're operating under. Yeah. So this is separate from the larger issue. Um, I, I do think, you know, this is an emergency dune restoration. This gives us a level of protection. I think we have to have a larger conversation after we figure out the core issues that we need to engage and talk about, you know, how do we protect our residents? How do we still create the quality of life? Um, because I, I still think there's, there's, there's a larger, there's a larger discussion. That's a tough discussion. The fact is that we can't get construction easements to protect their property is a problem because they don't want to block their view. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> it just is. We will be bringing forward, I believe the contract is scheduled to come the first meeting in January for design services for the full nourishment, a county-led effort. Uh, Commissioner Eggers? Yeah, that, that was kind of my question. Thank you, Commissioner Latvala. Um, the, the, there is a difference between what we've been talking about with the Army Corps easements and this one. This was a, a temporary construction easement, not only to, to pr protect our beaches, but protect our infrastructure. Correct, right. and it's very and specific to dunes. So, so we were still having problem getting those construction easements yep. from individuals. Correct. Right. Um, yeah, that, so, to me, you're right. That is a, a, a much larger question because we have infrastructure all along those beaches, not necessarily us, the cities, that have to be protected. And the reality I mean, is, is, is the water goes around it. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't care. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a gap, it goes around it and it travels path of least resistance down the road. I mean, I certainly understand the concern about the permanent easement and the issues that go with that with the Army Corps. That's yeah. a little bit different. Correct. Even though I wish there was a little bit more working together, but I still understand that one. But this one is a little bit different. I mean, this one to me is so critically important. Um, not only for the beaches, but well, for the infrastructure protection. So, you know. so beyond that, Commissioner Eggers, correct me if I'm wrong. I see this as a life, health, and safety issue. Mm -hmm. Water seeks its own level. And if you have a group of homes, you know, side by side by side, and one home in the middle is deciding they don't want to participate or be a partner, and salvaging their own property, they're putting everybody else around them at risk. Am I just missing something? No, you're, you're not missing something. And Well, as a policy, then I think we should make it very clear that we're not going to be there to salvage them at the end of the day if they're willing to let all their neighbors suffer because of their own selfishness. I've had some very very uh, difficult conversations yeah, with yeah. folks about this that I think the message and, and our communications department did some really great graphics that we put under the frequently asked questions section of the website um, to explain it because what they have out there today, what we built is, is all they're gonna have between them and the Gulf of Mexico for the next two hurricane seasons and, and at least two winters, that's it. And I encouraged them. I said, I understand it looks different than what was out there before. But the beach that we had before, even before Adalia, the storms that we've had, our beach was nourished at an elevation of five feet. And for reference, I am five feet tall. All right? The, the, the beach today, the flat part of the beach that people are walking on today is at one foot. So we lost four feet of elevation, hundreds of feet of width. And so the dune does look, in some ways, out of proportion. It is, because the, the actual beach itself is so much lower, it was scraped off than it was before. And so when we come in and nourish, or if we're able to move things forward with a core and somebody nourishes, that beach is going to be way up, about halfway up the dune and extending hundreds of feet out. We lost a lot of sand. It's gonna be a huge project to get this reconstructed fully. 
Madam Chair. Yes. To, to your to your to, oh, to your point, I think it's um, we will go back in and help those people. That's the whole point. And so up front, we're, there needs to be a communal effort to protect those beaches, right? I mean, well, it, so I mean, because we're going to come to somebody's rescue. That's what we. That's what well, government does. So we need to well, get. And, and it's not just coming to somebody's rescue. You're going to damage somebody else's property. Yeah. Because you yeah. you failed to heed the warning and allow a construction easement for that protection level, um, because it'll go out to the Gulf and travel down and damage everything in you know in yeah. between. And so, you know, we need to have this conversation. Um, and, and I don't want to be an alarmist, but you know, I had a commissioner and Commissioner Peters ask about you know, these conversations. I actually had a couple of representatives ask about this. We, there's a lot here. There's a lot in the temporary easements and the dunes, and then there's a lot with, you know, with our, our beach uh, restoration projects. You know? and, and so when we figure this piece out with the Corps, I really do believe we need to have some community conversations. Um, you know, and engage people and have those up and down to where we can, you know, create a path going forward. There's a lot of different options. I've heard options from you all. We have our own, you know, thoughts. Um, but I think we just need to have a very engaged discussion because everybody's impacted. You know, it's not just you and your property that would be damaged. It's, it's your neighbors behind the berm that they allowed <laughs> um, because it went around you. And so I think there's a lot there and I think we really need to be uh, open about ideas, but I think we have to come to a community decision on how we're gonna do this um, because everybody's impacted. But I, it would be helpful to have that once after we know where the core is um, and once we make that you know, decision. So. Commissioner Scott, did you have? Uh, just a quick, thank you, Madam Chair. Is there uh, any further update on the Army Corps? Um, our consultant testified yesterday. Um, is that correct? Uh, no, yesterday was actually a House committee meeting on WERDA, and there'll oh. be a Senate committee hearing on WERDA. They didn't really get into the anything specific yesterday. Okay. Um, it, was, it was very high level, but there were some comments about the need for the Corps to be flexible. And, and then he has, and then our specific. consultant has a meeting with uh, Senator Rubio and Scott next week. Yes, and um, uh, we have con just we we do have continued dialogue with the core. We meet with month with them monthly to talk through things and and you know see where areas where we can move forward. Um, the Army Corps is due a report to con uh, to Congress. Um, I think they said it was going to be delivered in January. Um, so that is going to be their explanation on the easement policy. Um, we have received some questions. I mean, Senator Scott has um, has engaged with the with the Assistant Secretary, asking for solutions, and uh, so hopefully that's kind of what we see. And uh, you know, we've just recently had some engagement, uh, some conversations with folks in South in South Carolina and North Carolina. And while the exact issues aren't the same, uh, the frustration uh, with with the easement issue is is we're we're, we're having this, those similar conversations. So it it isn't just a Florida thing. It's a it's kind of stretching up the East Coast, and and I there are there are absolute middle grounds and absolute ways to to find solutions that comply with the law, but also are specific to Florida's situation, to South Carolina's situation, without you know, giving up on, on what, what actually the Corps' mission and, and what, the, what the laws require them to do. Well, and also just want to just say thank you as well for, I've heard so many great things, particularly from beach mayors and residents along the, the beach of just the incredible response that, that we've had. So thank you so much for yeah. everything that you did on that. Yeah, the majority of people out there are just fantastic. They see our team, they see our construction staff out there and they just come running out and they're so excited. So yeah. Yeah. it's really good. Commissioner Peters. So um, do we have the, and I guess it's a dual question, do we have the authority to do like an emergency executive order kind of thing when it comes to the beach? Because if we can't protect our infrastructure, I mean, it's, I get we need this construction easement, but when you're under an emergency order, then aren't a lot of those things waived or not? Even under the circumstance with an executive order, if you're taking some kind of private property interest, the government can expect to pay for it in the long run. So it's really not gonna be much different. 
So the, it, what you're talking about is quick take, okay? So, you know, we, and so that is an option, that is a tool, um, but these are temporary construction easements. We typically don't go down the path for something that's a temporary construction easement because we, we wouldn't be getting an easement, we'd be taking the property. So very different process and it would be very litigious. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Anybody? Okay. All right, item 25 is an award of bid uh, to whatever, the cello uh, and Grogan. This is a uh, Pinellas. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, the bridge over the um, outfall canal and uh, up on the, for the north uh, trail. Okay, and so this, uh, this again come in way over budget, um, but we have no reason to believe that if, um, we bid it again, it's not gonna be any lower. So we only had one bidder on the project uh, as it is. Uh, so they've looked at it and staff's recommending approval. This is, uh, this is penny money. And this was planned as part of the North you know, Trail. We, pull, we had to pull it out separately um, as part of that because of the complexity of the project. Um, item 26, grant funding agreement, Florida Department. Okay, this is us getting 50% of the money back, so I urge approval of this. Um, <laughs> uh, um, item 27 is supplemental um, um, funding, uh, supplement number one to state funding agreement for Department of Transportation. And you're gonna see two of these. This is for the ATMS system. They're giving us more money. This is really a state road, so it be, should be heavier loaded to the state. Uh, this one is for uh, 580 uh, from Alt 19 over to US 19. Um, for uh, Route 580. And the same thing on the next one, this is for uh, State Road uh, 586. Uh, this is from Curlew to Honeymoon Park, again, where the state's just assuming uh, more of the cost associated with the ATMS project for that section. Um, 29 is renewal of uh, certificates of public uh, convenience and necessity for advanced life support providers. They are listed in your packet, uh, all the different providers. Item number 30 is a termination of agreement with Born Tech Solutions. This is the implementation team for our Oracle um, uh, Enterprise Resource Management Modernization. They were doing several different things. We've had continuing issues with them as the implementer. And so the um, uh, the OBEC team, which is our, our county staff made up of different entities, is recommending we just terminate that and we really look forward a full replacement or upgrade uh, to the Oracle system. Um, so, so we're canceling this contract. Item 20, 31 is countywide map. It's an annual update. This incorporates all the actions you know, taken throughout the year. Item 32 is an amendment to the advanced life support first responder agreements with three municipalities, independent fire districts, um, provides $1.15 million um, and the enhancements are listed. It's Largo Medic 42, traffic preemption project and requirements for the criminal justice information system to support um, the CAD. Under item 23, this is a request to ratify a litigation that has been filed. Um, just as a refresher, you all do have a resolution that was adopted that allows um, me, the county attorney, to go to the chair when there is an uh, action that needs to be filed on an emergency basis. Uh, this was a situation dealing with animals, um, an animal cruelty case. Uh, just as a follow-up, this case was filed, um, and we do have custody of the animals. Uh, a court order was entered granting the uh, county custody of the animals and prohibiting uh, the defendant from owning animals in the future. And there is also a criminal prosecution uh, going on at this point. So again, just um, pursuant to our process, asking that you ratify this case at your meeting on Tuesday. Um, and under 34, I do not anticipate having any reports. Do you, need, do you need any authority or action on that item today? No, we'll, we'll just be asking you under your normal course to, to ratify the action already taken on Tuesday. Okay, thank you. 35, I will have a county administrator's report. Uh, 36, appointments to the Emerging Medical Services Advisory Council. Again, they're listed within your packet. Um, 37, appointments to the Parks and Resources Con uh, Conservation Advisory 
um, by Commissioner Eggers. 38 is to appointments to the Public Library Cooperative uh, as a group does as a whole. Um, and you've got the person listed there. Um, 39, three appointments of the Pinellas Park Water Management District. And it's a reappointment. 40 is appointment to the uh, Value Adjustment Board as the board of a whole. Uh, 41 appointments, reappointments to the Feather Sound Community uh, District from Commissioners Long, Justice, Eggers, Latvala, Peters, and Flowers. And, and I, I have one to add to that as well. Um, Ryan Halstead um, wishes to be reappointed as well. I didn't hear you. Commissioner Scott, could you speak into the mic? Yes, uh, Ryan Halstead um, has notified me that he wishes to be reappointed as well. Okay, so if we Thank could you. add him. Just make an amendment you know, at the meeting. Item 42 is appointments, reappointments to the Historic Preservation Board, individual appointments by Commissioners Scott, Peters, uh, and a Board of the Whole. They're listed within your packet. And then, then the, you'll have a ballot worksheet for the at large and, and an alternate. 43 is a reappointment to the Lumen uh, Community Redevelopment Area Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, this, Recommends appointment of Jeremy Heath. And item 44 is the um, board chair appointments. And, and 45 is commissioner new business. We get over to item 46. This is a map amendment from activity center and target employment to activity center. Um, this is a modification to the um, Gandhi Boulevard, I-275 area. Uh, and it looks like they're shifting this. Can you, um, Tom, can you explain exactly what's occurring here? Under the existing development agreement, um, there's a, a time period of which you it can't get the residential built. Correct. And so it, they're asking for a shifting in the modification. Just rearranging what part of the project is gonna be completed. The multifamily will be completed first. In the initial development agreement, they will come second. Uh, so they're, they're realigning the. They're realigning what's in the development agreement right. because of the phasing of development. Okay. Um, 47 uh, residential general office to institutional 3.3 acres in Palm Harbor. Um, In July, you allow the applicant uh, to uh, time to amend to a more appropriate land use. Um, I guess they went back and looked. The current land use are allowed to a larger building area. Um, the proposal as um, here has received staff's recommendation along with the LPA recommendation um, based upon the changes that they've made. This was for a beauty salon. Any questions? 48, this is companion item 47 for the zoning. 49, um, this is the second public hearing for the Lemon form based code. 50 is the second um, public hearing for the, for the zoning classification for the Lemon community redevelopment area. Item 51, so this is um, approving an interlocal agreement, indebtedness, and expenditure uh, from the um, tax increment funds for the city of Deneen's redevelopment plan. So this goes back a long time, <laughs> and, and Joel can um, explain, and I'm sure Commissioner Eggers can explain this, but it's, it's, it's grandfathered in under their, uh, the original 95%. We typically have modified these, but because of the way this is structured, we really can't modify that. And so they're going to be, they're asking to be able to uh, issue long-term debt um, that'll be used, or that'll be paid for by the city and the county's contribution to the TIF. They're going to be building a second garage um, and some other uh, improvements uh, in their downtown area. But when, when it completes out in 2033, it's done. That meets the 45. They're not asking for an extension. It's just complying with the original. 
them doing a bond doesn't put any liability or uh, the county at all, does it? No, it, 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 it goes back, it's paid for out of resources from the TIF. Our contribution though, um, it, it, we really can't modify our contribution because of the way it was set up, but it will be paid for out of that through 2033, and then it'll be on the city to figure it out after that. They're not asking for an extension of that 45 year time period. Is that correct, Joel? It is, and my understanding, just from being briefed by my own staff, um, is that uh, stat, part of Barry's staff was reviewing this and looking at potentially decreasing uh, the county's contribution to some lower level, and you've seen that occur on some of the other CRAs. However, there are outstanding bonds currently that use part of that county's allocation uh, to secure those bonds, and we do have an ordinance in place that disallows um, a reduction in that TIF, and I'm sure it's part of the bond documents as well. So once once those bonds go out, we really can't adjust when those revenues have been pledged in support of the bonds. Thank you. Just one question. Yes, Commissioner uh, Raggers. Yeah, on, on CRAs, for instance, and we, I think they understand that 2033 will be the end, uh, it's almost 45 years of county participation. Do they still have to come back here to extend their piece of the CRA, or yeah. does that get our approval as well, even though it won't per, per, most likely not include funds? Yes, Yes, it would require us to modify it, um, but okay. again, the intent is that the county would not, right. the, the county would be out understand. of it. But yeah. we still would have to approve yes. for them to use their part of the funds to keep it in the Correct. CRA. Just like okay. we did with the one with St. Okay. Petersburg. And, you know. and, and Commissioner, just for reference, that's because we're a charter county and the statutes relating to community redevelopment areas vest authority in counties when they are a charter county. And as part of all of the delegations that you've done to municipalities over the years to undertake community redevelopment activities, you have maintained that level of control over all of the CRAs in the county. And, and that's part of the reason why the cities all have to come back to you for any changes. But, and just, well, the, go ahead. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just to be clear, because we, we're not changing the timelines, we're not changing, we're not changing the, the commitment of the county's funds, we're just approving this particular project? Yeah. Is that? For them to issue debt. And, and so how this originally started out, because I think you're gonna see half of Dunedin here on Tuesday, because they wanna make sure this is passed, but um, they're very <laughs> concerned about that. But, but remember, we've been trying to get these, these uh, CRAs down. Um, we've been trying to reduce them, you know, and so our original intent was to reduce them to 50%, you know, um, but you can't because of the debt. They would lose, they would lose the increment. You'd have to completely restructure the CRA. And so we're in agreement. Um, we do think that it makes sense for what they're using. Um, but, you know, again, those really should be, you know, in my opinion, city projects, but we're committed to it. We'll, we'll, we'll go, um, we're recommending that we, we go with the commitment that was made because there's debt, you know, that was issued as part of it. Um, but so again, and that's, I guess, just process question of, I mean, we've already committed to the money. Yeah. That's already, that's Correct. not, but in that original agreement, we had specific projects or borrowing or something that would need our approval. I'm just trying to understand the process a little. What you, what you all have typically done at the outset of the CRAs, particularly these older ones, is you adopted ordinances that govern them as well, and approval of debt is always included in those. So it, okay. a, a, the county approval of municipally issued debt has always been something that's been included that has to come back to the county for approval. Okay, all right, very good. One, one other thing. Commissioner Raggers? Uh, yeah, when this was approved, because I can remember coming to the county commission, this was done quite some time ago, and I, if, I'm not sure if I remember correctly, but the, the, the way we have set it up now, it wasn't available to us then. In other words, the 50%, the 75% or 70%, that's a policy change that we've made. Correct. Um, I don't know. About last four years ago. Four or five, yeah, yeah four years ago. No, we, 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 start, we worked with the commission because, yeah. you know, we, especially on these renewals, and we've got, and the reason I wanted to highlight that is you're going to see others coming forward and communities are coming forward for, for renewal periods and we're saying, no, we want to restructure this. Um, and and that's, this is a little different than those. That's, that, that was the only point I was making, that when this was done, it, that, those options weren't on the table. Yeah. So. Just yeah. for the record. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and again, their 15-year period, 
for their initial, for their 15 year review was back a while ago. We didn't have this policy in place. Okay, um, item 52 is an ordinance approving uh, Jables uh, for an economic uh, development tax incentive. Um, this was a uh, project was planned as part of a three phase uh, project. Phase one provided an, an extension. So this is um, approximately $280,000 in future um, cost. Most of you were here when we did the original and it had a three-phase piece to it. Um, item 53 is an ordinance creating an MSTU for recreation services. This is for the unincorporated Seminole MSTU. Um, so you'll see a lot of kids here on Tuesday. Um, they have, I've been sending out to you the public meetings that they've been having. Uh, great conversation. Everybody's pretty excited. So here you're establishing it. You don't actually have to establish the amount at this. Uh, we, we established the thing, then we'll come back and talk specifically about amount as part of the budget process. I'm, I have just have something to say now. There's a gentleman here I went, and I know Brian was there, and we looked at the the layout and what's how it's going to look and everything, and it's great. But I know it was mentioned to me that a lot of kids were going to be here, and they were curious if we could move that up on the agenda. I've already taken care of that. Oh, so, okay, great. So, so it is going to get moved up then? Yes. Yeah. You can move Perfect. it up to the beginning of your public hearings. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Item 54, um, this item has been withdrawn uh, by the applicant. Um, but item 55 has not. <laughs> um, and so this is an appeal of the decision of the county. This is what you voted on last time to allow for the public hearing, okay? And so this, is, this person is appealing to you of what county staff approved for, their, for the neighbor's dock. They're not happy about it. Okay, so. so 54 was withdrawn. 54 was withdrawn. Okay, but you will hear 55. Okay, item 56 is resolution supplementing the operating and capital for unanticipated revenues for American Rescue Plan Act, capital funds and general fund. And again, I'll ask Chris just to quiet, uh, do a quick rundown of the actions you're being asked to approve. Thank you, commissioners. Chris Rose, Office of Management and Budget. The four bullets that are in there are exactly what's going before you. So the first one are two projects at the Public Safety Center uh, where the sheriff is that we just need to get funded. Uh, one is for fuel lines at the generator and the second one is deep water wells. It's part of their HVAC system out there. And we're, getting, we're getting, uh, getting to a point where we need to get to those. And they weren't anticipated in the budget, but we now know what the numbers are on those. So that's first. Second bullet is $6,000 from the Health Facilities uh, Authority, Finance Authority, and it will be coming in as a donation. We need to put it out there for, uh, let's see, it's going to the St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg Free Clinic and the Clearwater Free Clinic, split half and half, 3,000 and 3,000. Then the next one is $172,000, which is a pure carry forward amendment, but we need to get it done early. It was budgeted in 23, not spent until 24, but the state attorney's contribution is so small, we need to supplement it for that now as opposed to waiting till later. The final one is the funding for the Dream Center, um, and it is the same mechanism that was approved previously by this board. Okay. Uh, two things. One, um, the, the new reserve policy, which you know, I disagreed with, but we have in place now, does this unanticipated amount drop us below that level, that newly established level? No, sir, it does not. We, we did come in a little better than we thought at the end of last year. And the second thing is, is that um, I would really like to take the first three bullet points separately and have the fourth one um, just a separate item. I'd like to be able to vote yes on some of it. So if, if that's the will of the commission. So thank you. Any other questions? Okay. And item 57 is an award of bid 
to Ring Power Corporation for the Public Safety Fuel Replenishment System. And that's a companion item to the funding piece on 56. So we, we could have had this on the regular agenda, but you need to approve the funding um, first in order to issue the contract. And this is um, out of the public safety complex and um, that system needs to be redone. Yeah, it seemed like a weird one to have on the public hearing part. <laughs> right. I, I just asked that question at the meeting. I'm like, okay, how can we approve the contract? We haven't moved the money. So, Got you know, <laughs> I'm like, since it's on the same, I mean, let's. Commissioner so. Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I stepped out of the room when we were going through the consent item, but items 10 through 14 um, were the constitutional officer reports. It appears there was a uh, $8.3 million thereabouts being returned. Um, and I'm just curious as to where that where that money goes. Uh, that, and you're, I'm assuming you're thinking about from the, the tax collector? Yeah. Um, that's annual, and so that comes into the general fund. That's okay. Well, there was that, it looked like there was, from the clerk, there was one point uh, from the clerk. Well, come on, come on, come on up, Chris. I, you, you know the answer to these, I don't. right commissioner it is both tax collector and clerk and it goes into the general fund and these are anticipated revenues mostly yes okay so Was we, there, we count we count on those each year so we project those out we work with the tax collector okay. that's them returning the money it looked like the sheriff returned over six million as well the sheriff did you're right um that's mainly the cad program he was gonna spend it in 23 we'll be coming back to move it into 24. That all goes back to general fund. General fund, and then and that'll be re for the sheriff. It'll be reappropriated back to the CAD project. Correct. So it's not a reduction. Right. It's just going to get moved to a different fiscal year. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. But we we project those revenues coming in, especially for the tax collector. Um, <coughs> the clerk, I'd like. To, I'm going to work with him about those projections because we gave him more money as part of his budget when he when his fees were down. So we'll have to kind of relook at that. You know anticipation of next year okay. thank you Chris uh, so Commissioner Peters notified me that we have now finished the agenda and I would like to um, make mention of the fact that today is a very special day and perhaps Commissioner Eggers would like to speak to why I say that yeah well thank you uh, madam chair um, yeah, today is D-Day. Um, I'm not a historian by any stretch of the imagination, but obviously a, a big deal, right? Is it 12-6? Was, was it 12-6? 12-7? One of the two. It's a big day in our history, and um, folks, um, you know, we think back to 9-11 and, and what happened in, those, in that day. I was talking to a young man who's 13 years old from high school the other day. Uh, obviously, he wasn't alive when 9-11 happened. Um, and uh, you almost have to be 30 years old to have remembered 9-11. And then as you started thinking about that in the perspective of our country's history and the few remaining veterans that were alive uh, way back in 12-7-1941 uh, when D-Day occurred, it just strikes me that um, the teaching, I'm certainly hoping that our schools are teaching that history. It's a critically important date, not only for how great our country was in terms of uh, stepping up when evil was to the east of us, to the west of us, and all around us, but just making sure that they remember the important days in our history. Um, and certainly 9-11, they certainly, we've, we're doing that. We have 9-11 ceremonies all over the county, all over the country. Um, uh, but it seems like D-Day is starting to fade away. Um, and just wanted to bring it up and remind folks that it is an important day in our Nation's history. Yeah. Well, yeah. What? Did I mess that up? Yes, I you messed did. that up. But it doesn't matter. We, no, we, we're we knew, we knew what you meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yes, right. 6 6 was D Day. Right. Um, and thank you for correcting me. I wish you'd have stopped me earlier. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but yes. He was there. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was something. Apparently, you, I was. You were in school then. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. D Day. <laughs> versus Pearl Harbor Day. Yeah, and you know, it was weird when I was reading about Pearl Harbor Day that it took so long to get the messaging of Pearl Harbor Day across our country. 
um, so that it was like days later almost before people or weeks later before people were hearing about it. And now something happens in a moment, we hear about it. Uh, it doesn't matter where it is in the world. Um, but thank you for correcting me on that and to the veterans of this, <laughs> of this county, I apologize for messing that up. But still, nonetheless, an important day in our nation's history and I don't, didn't want it to go unnoticed. Uh, and thank you for reminding me about Pearl Harbor Day. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. Not for screwing it up, but thank yeah. you for <laughs> trying to. It won't be the last time. Okay, you said that. I did not. <clears throat> okay, the other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is the Armed Forces Family Foundation in intends to submit an application for the temporary closure of the Skyway Bridge on March 3rd for their annual 10K event. This board has historically supported and provided a letter of support in the past to be sent to the Secretary of FDOT in past years. So I am just asking as a courtesy the board for a consensus to send a letter of support for next year's race. Is that every, okay with everyone? Yes, 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 and yes, okay. And I, and I heard Commissioner Latvala say that he was gonna run it. I'm sorry? I heard Commissioner Latvala say he was gonna run it. I signed up for the Country Club. I signed up. <laughs> and then what happened? Did you show up? <laughs> See how cagey he is? Um, okay, do you want to discuss now or do you want to wait until our meeting on Tuesday to talk about the uh, recommendations made by our incoming chair for next year for committee assignments. What are the wishes of the board? I'm sorry? I said if we need a discussion, we need to take questions. Okay, do we want to discuss it today or on Tuesday? Or both, I don't know. I just think it's... Apparently there are some questions or concerns. Commissioner Flowers, did you have any? I'm sorry? I'll discuss on Tuesday. Okay, she'd rather discuss on Tuesday. Anybody else? No? Happy uh, first day of Hanukkah to those that uh, of our Jewish residents in Pinellas County. Thank you. And there is an event in Clearwater tonight at Coachman. Did I you say today it. is or Tuesday? Today. Today. Okay. today. Oh, today? Do you know what time? I believe 5.30 or thereabouts. Okay. Is that it? Okay, well then without further ado, we are adjourned.